Welcome to this video on statistical mechanics, which I've made for my students in statistical mechanics at the Delft University of Technology. My name is Jos Dyson. This uh, video deals with, uh, in fact, what particles do in a liquid or in a gas. Um, they follow an erratic motion, which is, of course, very difficult to describe. And it's also not particularly interesting what a particular particle does. But on the other hand, the statistical properties of the motion of particles is, is, is of quite uh, some interest. Uh, and phenomenon like diffusion uh, can be described in this way if we would know the average behavior of the particles. And uh, in order to get a handle on this behavior, we make some uh, assumptions concerning the forces that act on these particles, and they are due to the, to the surroundings of the particles. We don't want to, to have a detailed theory for the cause of these forces and then derive the form of the force from it, but we make some assumptions about the force which are reasonable, at least in some limits. And from that we infer what the properties, the average properties of the motion are. And uh, in the end we will be able in this way to describe diffusion, also drift and diffusion. And it's important to realize that the techniques that we use are not uh, limited to particles moving in a liquid or in a dense gas. Uh, they are widely used, in fact, for uh, degrees of freedom that are subject to fluctuations of which we don't have uh, too detailed information. And therefore we always make the, the very similar assumptions to the one that I make in this movie. I hope it is useful for people watching it. Here you see a molecular dynamics simulation of a Leonard Jones gas. Those are atoms which interact via a Leonard Jones potential attractive well and a repulsive core. And the particles are atoms, they are rendered by blue dots. But there is one particle which has been singled out, that's this blue particle here. And the blue particle is just one of the atoms, it's an arbitrary atom. and. Uh, by giving it a different color, it's easy to see how it uh, moves through the gas. And as you can see, it's kind of random walk motion. The particle receives kicks from the other particles, and that moves the particle, the blue particle, around. And uh, we shall see that although the trace, the motion for each individual particle is uh, completely impossible to predict, it's possible to make definite statements about the motion in general that the particle makes. So we can make statistical uh, statements about that motion. And that is the subject of this movie. In fact, we focus on the special case where we have a large particle, that's this disk here, which is moving in a uh, dense gas or fluid consisting of small particles and they bounce off this large particle and that gives rise to the famous Brownian motion and its motion is determined by the light particles which collide many times with the heavy ones. So the disk is moving slowly and the other particles are moving a lot faster because equipartition tells us that the kinetic energy is equally distributed over the particles but a heavy particle then has a much smaller speed. The effect of the collisions by the light particles with the heavy particle is uh, twofold. First of all, the heavy particle will feel a drag. You can imagine that if the heavy particle moves at uh, some speed through the liquid, it will experience many more head-on collisions than it will experience kicks in the back and therefore its uh, speed will uh, slow down until it comes approximately to a rest. So the first force that the heavy particle feels is a drag force. On top of the drag it will feel random kicks in all possible directions and so you have random kicks on top of a drag. So first of all we have the drag and then there are random kicks that even if the particle has come to a rest, there is no drag anymore, but there will be random kicks uh, in all kinds of directions. We want to capture the effect of both the drag and the random kicks in an equation of motion. The drag force is easy to incorporate because we know its form, it's minus gamma times V. 
that's the usual form for the drag force. Then the random kicks, we represent them just by a force R, which is a vector and it must have some random character. And that represents the random kicks. And eventually there is a field like gravity, or if the particles are charged, it may be an electric field, which is a systematic force. And we can include that and we call it F depending on position and time. So the F is a systematic force. The drag force and the systematic force are rather familiar, but uh, the same cannot be said of the random force. However, although the random force itself is by nature unpredictable, we can make some statistical statements about it. So we can make some statements about the statistics of the random force. The first property of the random force is that its expectation value is equal to zero for all times. So imagine the fluid or the gas being uh, at rest, which means that its center of motion is at rest. Then obviously if I put a particle in, the uh, and I put a particle initially at rest, it will get random kicks from all directions and these will average out. That's an average in time. So what does the average here with the angular brackets mean? Because this is evaluated at one particular time, t. Well, the average uh, expressed by these angular brackets is an average over all the possible realizations of the random force. So if we uh, start a simulation or an experiment, we get a certain random force, then we do it again and again and again. So we have a long series of random forces at subsequent times. And if we average, average over that series, then it turns out that this average is, uh, that this random force is zero. So the angular brackets is, uh, represents an average over all the possible realizations of the random force. The second property of the random force is a, uh, formulated as a statement about the correlations. So imagine we take the random force at some time t, at some arbitrary time, and then we take the random force at some time tau later than t, so t plus tau. In that case, the value, the expectation value averages out to zero whenever the tau is greater than zero. So when, t when we look really at a later time, the random kicks have nothing to do with the random kicks that you saw before. Now in a liquid, we know that that is not true because in a liquid you have hydrodynamic correlations. So this is an approximation. And in fact, that uh, approximation is valid for heavy particles because they, they will experience uh, many collisions before they change their position appreciably. So if the time scale at which the heavy particle moves is a lot slower than the correlation time in the fluid, this is a good approximation. However, if I take just one atom uh, feeling random kicks by the other atoms, it turns out that this assumption is not valid. So why do we make that assumption? It's for mathematical convenience because it enables us to infer all kinds of properties without too much mathematical effort. This is therefore an approximation that is made very frequently. So it says that the correlations between subsequent random forces vary. Of course, if tau is zero, then I just have the expectation value of the random force squared. The final property of the random force is that it's uh, subject to a Gaussian distribution. So each force is drawn from a Gaussian probability distribution. PR represents the probability density for finding a random force of uh, size r. This uh, should in fact be a, uh, a vector, but uh, you can read this as one component of r. So each component of r uh, 
uh, is subject to this probability distribution, which means that if we run, for example, a computer simulation, we draw a random force at each time from a Gaussian random distribution, and then we feed that into the equation of motion. And we do that for each component, so that's why R here is not a vector but just a number. When discussing random forces, it's anyhow convenient to think in terms of a computer program. And in a computer program, what we do in order to solve the equation of motion is to uh, discretize the time. So we have time steps t1, t2, etc. They are equidistance, which means that the distance between time between two subsequent time steps is always delta t. In the simulation, we generate a random force at, for each time step. And the properties that we have formulated before translate into the following recipe. The uh, probability density for having a random force R1 at time t1, R2 at time t2, etc., is given by this expression, which is a Gaussian expression, and the fact that the forces are uncorrelated at subsequent time steps uh, just causes this probability to be the product of the individual Gaussian probabilities. We can then return to the continuum notation. We have a sum over r's at subsequent time steps. We can write, formulate that as an integral if we divide uh, by an extra factor of delta t. And uh, so we have now formulated the uh, probability distribution as a continuum distribution. And uh, we use a shorthand notation 2q for the denominator here. And so this is our continuum prescription for the probability density of having a force uh, between t1 and tn. If we then recall our prescription, which was that the correlation uh, function of the random force led to a delta function, we can write the for Rn, Rm, and this is now one dimensional, uh, that it's equal to R squared delta m and m. That's now a discrete delta function in the discrete time. It is interesting also to consider the correlation property of the uh, random force. We can formulate that also in discrete time. Uh, note that I have taken here a scalar R, so this is one component of a vector random force. And in discrete time, this will give me an Rn times Rm, the random force at times Tn and Tm. And that is equal to the average value squared times, well, this delta function in discrete time turns into a delta Nm divided by delta T. Because the integral over the delta function is 1, we need the 1 over delta T here. And uh, due to this property here, we see that the width of R squared is always this Q. So we have a Q over delta T times delta Nm. So this R squared is just Q based on the properties of Gaussian integrals and the second moment. Next, we turn to the solution to the Langevin equation. And in general, that solution is difficult to find. But in the case where the systematic force is equal to zero, we can uh, make some statements about the solution. So that's the case where we will be now. And uh, the uh, Langevin equation then reads as follows. We have mv dot is minus gamma v, that's the drag force, plus r which depends on t and which is a random force. This equation is called the Langevin equation. The Langevin equation is a, di a differential equation in V and it's a homogeneous equation for one dimension and therefore we can first try to solve the homogeneous solution. So we take r equal to zero and then we are left with this equation and that gives us the homogeneous solution V uh, wiggle is v wiggle zero times e to the power minus gamma t over m. So this is the homogeneous solution. Then we need to find a particular solution and we do that using the standard method. We try a solution of the form Vt is uh, the homogeneous solution times some function that depends on time. And if we plug that into the differential equation, we get the following. 
first of all we have two time dependencies one here and one there so we get two terms from the m times uh, v dot those are those two terms and on the right hand side we have here the drag force and here we have the random force and the uh, drag force is cancelled on the left and right hand side so here you see that this term is identical to that term and so we are left with a simple equation for f this equation can be directly written as f dot is some function on the right hand side which depends on t and this can easily be solved when I say solved, it means writing the solution formally as an integral over a function involving the random force. And because we don't know the random force, there is no way we can integrate this function analytically. Putting this f into the form for v that we have written here, we obtain the following solution. We have here the particular solution, that is the one we just found, and this is the homogeneous solution which we can uh, add with an arbitrary p prefactor. And because we take the integral from zero, this prefactor should be the velocity at time t is zero. As mentioned before, the second term is not amenable to analytic solution, but we can definitely infer some statistical properties of the solution for V using the statistical properties for R. We can, for example, calculate the expectation value of this V. We put angular brackets, which means that we uh, average over all the possible realizations of the random force. And because the average value of this random force equals zero for all times, the solution will just be the first part because the second part vanishes. So on average, we can find what the V in the course of time is. Obviously, that's the average behavior, and it's interesting to see how V would vary around this average solution. In order to find that out, we calculate the v squared of t, so that we can later subtract the v uh, expectation value squared. That's this expression, so the difference is this term. And uh, now we have here two r's, because we have two integrals. We have first an integral for the first v and then for the second one. We call the, integrant, uh, the integration variables t1 and t2. And therefore, we have an expectation value of rt1 and rt2. And we know from the statistical properties of r that we can write this as q times delta t1 minus t2. t2 and that uh, simplifies the integral a lot. Working out the integral, we obtain the following result. So here we have a q which now enters in front of a single integral because we had a delta function. The delta function tells us that t1 is equal to t2, so we have now 2 times gamma, and I now have called the integration variable t primed. We can carry out this integral, it's a very simple integral, and the result is that we have v squared, v0 squared times minus 2 gamma t over m plus q over 2 gamma m times 1 minus e to the power of minus 2 gamma t over m. So what do we have? We have an average behavior, and that average behavior is typically the solution to a drag equation, exponentially damped velocity, and we have also an expression for the uh, variation. So if we subtract this term from the left and right hand side, this turns out to be the fluctuation, the average value of v with respect to its uh, average velocity. And we see that for long times, this term decays, and we are left with just q over 2 gamma m. So for long times, the first term, of course, decays to zero. Also, this term decays to zero, and we are left with a constant for the expectation value of v squared. So here I've written down that uh, very same statement. It's uh, q divided by 2 gamma m, that's the expectation value of v squared. But if the particle is in equilibrium in a liquid or in a gas, we know from the equipartition theorem that the velocity squared expectation value should be kbt over 2 over m. And therefore we find an expression for q in terms of the temperature and the friction coefficient. So q is 2 gamma kbt.
We have seen that the Langevin equation is an equation of motion in which there is a frictional force and there is a random force. We will study that equation from now on just for simplicity with m equal to 1. And what we want to do now is not to study individual trajectories, but we want to see what the probability is to find a particle with a particular velocity v at a certain time t. So we search an equation for this probability density, which is time and velocity dependent. So suppose we know where the particle is at t, what its velocity is. We can find the velocity at the next time step. We discretize the time now with a time step delta t. And we find that the new velocity is the same as the old velocity plus the force, which is minus gamma v plus r delta t. So let's make a cartoon of this equation. We have the old velocity, which is vt, and this first term minus gamma v times delta t, which is here shown in green, that reduces that velocity. So all the velocities are reduced by this term. And then we consider the next term. That is the term with the random force r. So we show the distribution of the random force, which is Gaussian in blue. And here we show r delta t. So this is the probability distribution for the second step r delta t. We want to find an equation for p at the next time step. So the distribution for the velocities in the next time step, provided we know the velocity distribution in the old time step. And therefore, we have to integrate over all the possible uh, previous velocities, and we call these now v old. So we integrate over dv old. And in addition, we integrate over all the possible steps drt, r delta t, like this. The probability that we were at a v old is given by p v old at time t, at the previous time step. The probability that we make a jump of r delta t, we call that curly p. So this is my curly p. That's a Gaussian distribution. So please note that I have a, 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 a simple p like this, and I have a curly p. The curly p is a Gaussian distribution, and we don't know what the p of v is. But of course, we cannot have just any v old and any displacement v delta t, because we want to restrict ourselves to those combinations which give us the new v here. And we realize that constraint using a delta function. So here I have inserted a delta function which guarantees that this equation holds. So this is the v in this equation. So in this equation here we call this v. This is the v old. And this is also the v old. And so if I want to satisfy this equation, then I can realize that using this delta function. And because we have a delta function, it's now easy to work out the integral over the v old. And we see that the delta function uh, does not have v old in its argument, but a factor times v old. And then we need to use this rule for working out the delta function. And we obtain then the following result. So here is the result. First, we have a term 1 over 1 minus gamma delta t, which comes from working out this delta function with the 1 minus gamma delta t in front of the v old. And this v old here has been replaced by the uh, remaining arguments in the delta function. So that's v plus gamma v minus r delta t. This is the new v, and the old v is related to the new v in this way, and I still have the probability distribution, 
the Gaussian probability distribution here and I'm left with only one integral because the delta function has been used to do away with the integral over the field. And looking at this equation we immediately see that it's useful to, because a delta t is taken to be small to do a Taylor expansion for the p. So that is the next step and we do that Taylor expansion to second order in the delta t. So here is the result. This is the zeroth order term, which I find by taking delta t equal to zero. Then here is the first order term and here the second order term. Uh, all the p's and its derivatives are all evaluated at v and t, except that I have not uh, mentioned those, uh, I've not reproduced those arguments explicitly in the last term. We are going to work out all the terms to order delta t. So let's first look at the first term, which is multiplied by pr delta t, and then we integrate over dr delta t. But because we make always one uh, step r delta t, this probability density is normalized. So that means that if we integrate over delta r, uh, over r delta t, like we do here, we always get a result one. And because there's no r delta t dependence in this term of the integral, the first term we obtain, the zeroth order term, is just p v t, because the integral of the remainder just gives us zero, it gives us one. And then, if we want to work out everything up to order delta t, we see that we can multiply this by one plus gamma delta t. The next two terms each give us contributions which themselves are at least of order delta t. So this delta t correction will give at least an order delta t squared. And because we work consistently up to order delta t, this term will not have any effect on the next two term terms, not to order delta t. Now we consider the second term, and first we have a gamma v times delta t, which I've copied here, multiplied by dp dv, and then we have again the same integral of a normalized probability distribution, so that gives me just the one. This term here with the r, the probability distribution here is Gaussian, and it's symmetric. So if we multiply it by r, we get an anti-symmetric integral. So this after integration will lead to zero. So this is the complete result that we obtain from the second, or second term, which is the term to first order in delta t in the Taylor expansion. So let us continue with the second order term from which we first obtain a contribution gamma squared v squared delta t squared over 2 and then again we have an integral of the second derivative of p multiplied by a normalized Gaussian so that just gives me a 1. The term which is linear in R vanishes for the same reason that this one vanishes. We have an anti-isometric integrand and then we have an extra term and that term is equal to delta t squared over 2 times d squared p dv squared and then we have an integral of r delta t squared. So the fact that I've put the delta t squared here means that I can leave it, at, leave it out here. Then we have a p r delta t and we integrate over that r delta t. So this is the second moment of my Gaussian distribution. Now we have seen above that the 
that this in fact it can be written as the expectation value of r squared times delta t squared and we had seen that that was q over delta t and the q had the value 2 gamma kbt and therefore we see that the second term acquires the following form it is gamma times kbt times delta t times the second derivative of p with respect to v squared now there is one final step we need to perform we have the difference here of pv taken at t plus delta t and pv at t if we take only the first one and we bring it to the left hand side and that's obviously the first derivative of p and so we arrive at the following equation an equation which gives us the time the derivative of this probability distribution and it depends on the first derivative here and the second derivative of p in fact this term of course when i work it out it generates two terms one is the term here with the gamma delta t that's uh, the term when the, I take the derivative with respect to v, and the, when I take the derivative with respect to v, p, I get the second term here. This equation is a famous equation, and it's known as the Fokker-Planck equation. In order to check whether the Fokker-Planck equation makes sense, we look at the stationary solution, which we find by taking the time derivative of p equal to zero. In that case, the right-hand side of this equation should be zero, and it is solved by the following expression. pv is c times minus v squared over 2kbt. If we had included the m in our derivation, we would have also have had also an m in this equation, and then it would be minus mv squared over 2 kbt. So what we have obtained is the in fact the Maxwell distribution. It's the Boltzmann distribution for the speed. And we have obtained that for the special case m is equal to 1. For the case where m is not equal to 1, we find the following Fokker-Planck equation, which includes an m in the first term in the denominator and an m squared in the second term. We have been dealing with particle moving under the influence of other particles, and so the motion of the particle under consideration can be uh, characterized as a random walk. And for random walks, there is a very famous result which tells us that the displacement squared after long times is equal to 2d times t, where d is a constant that's called the diffusion constant. So from the Langevin equation that we have analyzed, could we infer that indeed this is the behavior? That's question number one. And the second question obviously is what would be this, this d, this diffusion constant? So we try to find x squared t, but so far we have been dealing only with the velocity. Now there is a simple relation between the x and the velocity, just the time integral over v. And we can use the known uh, solution for v from the Langevin equation in order to make some statements about the x. Recall that the solution for the velocity that we have found above for the a Langevin equation had this form. First we have a homogeneous solution and then we have to add a particular solution which depends on this random force R. So what we could do is take this V, plug it in there and then calculate x squared and then take the expectation value. That's quite a bit of work and therefore we take a shortcut. This shortcut starts by writing up the equation of motion not in terms of v but in terms of the x. So we get mx dot dot is minus gamma x dot, that's the drag plus the random force. We multiply this equation on the left and right hand side by x and then we will take the expectation value. But let's first do this so we calculate uh, x times x dot dot 
And uh, my claim is that we can write this as the time derivative of x times x dot minus x dot squared, because if I work out this, I get two terms. One is this term and the other one is that term. So in order to get that term, I need to uh, subtract this velocity squared term. M times the velocity squared is twice the kinetic energy, can be related to KBT, equipartition theorem, and then we obtain the following equation. I have uh, moved the term with the minus gamma to the left hand side and the kinetic energy to the right hand side and replaced it by the constant KBT. And then here we have an RT times an XT. Then we take the expectation value everywhere and recall that taking the expectation value means averaging over all the possible realizations of the random force. So here we have uh, just an expectation value of x times x dot. Here we have the same expectation value. Here is a constant, so the expectation value has no effect. And here we have the expectation value of the random force times x. But the random force itself is completely independent of x, whether the particle is here or there. It will not have any effect on the random force and therefore it's uncorrelated from x. So this we can put the x outside of the expectation value and then we find just the average value of the random force r. And we have already seen several times that that is equal to zero. So this term disappears from the equation. And so we have now an equation in terms of the expectation value of x times x dot, which we can call, for example, y. The solution can easily be found. It's a straightforward differential equation, and it reads c plus a times e to the power minus gamma t of rem, where c and a are constants. c is not an arbitrary constant. But if I plug the solution into the equation, I see that it must be equal to kbt over gamma. And therefore, if we take the time to infinity, then I'm left with just C, and that's KBT over gamma for this quantity here. If the time is taken at zero, then obviously this quantity should be zero because X is the displacement from zero, from its position at zero. And from that, I find that also the A is minus KBT over gamma. And it's important to note that we can write x x dot as half times the time derivative of x squared. This implies that we need to integrate once more in order to find x squared itself. This is the derivative of x squared. And if we uh, then do perform the integral, we arrive at the following expression. 2 kbt over gamma times t plus 2 kbt over gamma m, g, m over gamma e to the power minus gamma t of rem minus 1. Let us first find the short time behavior for x squared. So we are looking at short times, which means that we can Taylor expand this exponential here. And I have a Taylor expanded here to second order. And it turns out that the term with t here is cancelled by the first order term here. The zeroth order term is cancelled by the minus one. And so I'm left with a term that scales with t squared. And this indicates that for very short time scales, and that short means that t is a lot smaller than m over gamma, we have ballistic motion because the displacement itself is proportional to t. So the displacement squared is proportional to t squared. And that's just the motion of a free particle. And that tells us that the collisions have not yet shown their effect if the t is smaller than m over gamma. When the collisions come into effect, then we cross over to a different behavior. For large times, we can calculate the x squared too. And in that case, let us go back to the original equation. Then the exponential will decay. And so we are left with uh, this term and the term with a one, but when t is large, this term will be uh, much larger than that term. So we can safely ne neglect the minus one. And what we then find is that we have 2kt over gamma times t. And so that's two times the diffusion coefficients times t.
and so what we find is that d is kbt over gamma we have to express the diffusion constant in terms of the temperature and the friction coefficient to the drag this gamma there is a uh, hydrodynamic equation for that it's given uh, as six times pi times eta times a where eta is the hydrodynamic viscosity and a is the particle radius so that's the radius of a particle so if we have a uh, large particle moving in a fluid and the particle has radius a then it will experience a drag which is given by this formula this result is known as Stokes' law. When we were analyzing the Langevin equation for V, we also were interested in finding the probability distribution for V as a function of T. Uh, now we have moved to the analysis of X, so it's natural to look at a probability distribution for finding a particle in uh, at position x and that means that obviously px t times dx is the probability to find the particle inside the small interval dx running from x to x plus dx at time t so it's a time dependent probability now we can make the following statement v as we have seen is linear in r now x is the integral of v so x is linear in v and therefore x is also linear in r now RT uh, has a Gaussian distribution and because X is linear in R, XT is also a Gaussian distribution because if we have a Gaussian distribution, uh, consider for example e to the power minus alpha X squared, then if I change X by AX plus B, that will be also a Gaussian distribution. Any linear transformation leaves, leaves the Gaussian character of the distribution invariant. Now we have calculated before that the width of this Gaussian was 2 times d times t, that was the diffusion law. So the probability to make a step dx squared scales linearly with the time t, 2 dt. And therefore the transition probability, I call that t, and so it's a probability to make a step of size delta x within a time interval t, so I call this the transition probability. That should therefore be a Gaussian, because if we know that the average of a step, of a random step, is zero. It should be a Gaussian, and the width of the Gaussian is known, so we can immediately write it up. And so we see that it also contains a normalization factor, this is just a normalization factor which is induced by this term in the denominator of the exponent. Now having this tr transition probability we can write up a, an equation which gives us the evolution of this probability distribution p. So we start from a distribution at time t and we want to make a statement about the, the distribution at t plus delta t. So if at a later time t plus delta t we are at position x then at the previous time t we were at a position x minus delta x and the probability to go from this situation to that situation is given by the probability to make a step of size delta x and that's this t that we have just found here the gaussian this probability distribution and because the delta x is uh, supposed to be small if uh, the time here delta t is also small it's uh, natural to make a Taylor expansion uh, and we can do that straightforwardly so here we take first the delta x is zero so we get the p at x at t so this is the situation where the particle does not move at all because it was at x at time t and it's at x also at t plus delta t then we have the first order term where we have the first derivative of the p and the second order term with a factor of one half and here is the t I've left out, the t dependence from the capital T. And uh, if we then calculate the integral, we see that if I multiply delta x, here is no delta x dependence, but if we multiply that by the symmetric Gaussian distribution t and we integrate over x, then u to the anti-symmetry of the integral, this term will give zero. Uh, 
And so in the end, I'm left with this, where the delta x squared is the second moment of this distribution. And we know what that is. We can infer that directly from the Gaussian distribution. That distribution had a width of 2 times d times delta t. And because of the factor of 1 half, we find now, find now this equation. Then we have here, if we move this one to the left hand side, we see that it can be written as the first order time derivative times delta t. And then we obtain the following equation. We have d p dt, partial derivative with respect to t, is d times d squared p dx squared. And it's important to note here that this equation, it's called the diffusion equation but it's only valid if the v if the d is constant so the d does not depend on x so d constant it's also possible to derive an equation for a non-constant d in that case there is also a x dependence in the t so that has to be taken into account when taylor expanding uh, the terms here in the integral and in that case what you find is d dx and then we have a x dependent diffusion constant dp dx where the p depends on x and t so that's general it's important to emphasize the assumptions that we have made so far. First of all, we have assumed that we are in the diffusive limit and that is justified provided that the time step is larger than m over gamma because otherwise we are in the ballistic regime still. On the other hand, we have made a Taylor expansion and that is justified only when the delta x is small. So the transition step should be small. Well, looking at the distribution, it uh, means that this uh, delta x is a lot smaller than uh, dt. Delta x squared should be a lot smaller than dt. And uh, that is justified if the time is long enough. Now we move to an alternative derivation of the diffusion equation, which is via Fick's law. And Fick's law tells us that the flux of particles through some uh, area, surface area, is uh, equal to rho, that's the density of the particles, times their velocity. So I have here a small surface area A, and the flux is just the number of particles passing through A and I calculate that per, I divided by A, so I calculate it per unit area and I calculate it per delta T. So these are the number of particles passing through A uh, in time delta T. Of course, if I wait twice as long, I will have twice as many particles. So dividing by delta T makes it independent of this delta T. And the same holds for the area. If I double the area, I have twice as many particles passing through it. And Fick's law tells us that the flux through this area is given as the density of the particles, just the number of particles per volume, times their velocity, times their average velocity. And I will now derive that uh, law in some detail. I consider the fusion of particles uh, along a one-dimensional axis, that's the x-axis, and we have a point uh, x is zero, and we look at the flux. We want to calculate the flux through this point x is zero, and therefore we consider particles which at some time uh, started off at a position x0 which is smaller than 0 and these particles are traveling during some time delta t and initially they were definitely located at this position but they will form a Gaussian distribution after some time and so therefore we will have this Gaussian uh, 
distribution, expressing the distribution of the particles after some time delta t, which is obviously positive. And if you want to calculate the flux through x is zero, uh, that's just the number of particles which has, have passed the point x is zero, and they are uh, the particles which are on the right tail of the Gaussian. And therefore we can write up immediately an expression for the flux through x is zero due to the particles coming from x is zero. Here is that expression, we have a Gaussian distribution and I integrate only the part uh, for the positive x's and the x0 which occurs here as the center of the Gaussian should be negative. So we have an x0 smaller than zero. And I can do the same for particles released at the positive x-axis. The blue Gaussian curve is centered at an x0 which is positive and the particles which have contributed to the flux through the point x is zero are the ones that I find in the left tail of the Gaussian distribution. And therefore the mathematical expression for this is the following. So we have for particles coming from the right, the integral which is given here, it's uh, the green shaded part in this picture. And now in order to derive the diffusion equation, we assume that at some time we had a, a distribution of particles, which is given by rho of x. Each of those particles can diffuse according to these evolutions. And uh, therefore we multiply this by rho at x zero and we integrate over rho x zero. And that's the flux of particles passing uh, to the right of x is zero. We do the same for this one, we multiply it by rho of x is zero and then we integrate over all the x zeros and that is the contribution to the flux to the left. The flux to the right has a positive sign, the flux to the left has a negative sign, so we need to subtract this integral then from that integral and this results in the following. We take the first expression, x0 being negative, Let me. and we integrate over all the possible positions. Here we multiply that by the density of particles at that position at time t, uh, and then we wait for some time delta t, and then these particles are distributed according to the black curve, and this integral then calculates the red area for each of the, the particles starting off from the left. And then here we have the same expression, but then for x0 positive, and it has a minus sign because uh, we are calculating now flux for particles going to the left. The rightmost integral can be reworked because we can swap the two boundaries of the integral. We can also change their sign, then nothing changes in the overall sign, so I still have a minus, and I have now an integral from minus infinity to zero over dx zero, and the integral over dx. I do the same for that one. I have a zero to infinity. Nothing changes here, because both x and x zero have changed sign, but there is a difference in the row, which is here, uh, here it depends on x zero, and because I've swapped the sign of the integ integ integration variable, this is now row of minus x zero t. Also, since we shall be interested in short times, we expect the particles contributing to the flux to be located very close to x0. It is natural to make a Taylor expansion for rho as a function of x0. So we write that rho x0t is a rho of 0t plus x zero times rho primed. And with rho primed, I mean the derivative with respect to the first argument, so with respect to the x 
and this assumption then simplifies this long expression here. First of all, we see that if I take row 0 t, and that term is the same for this one and that one, and then we see that the two integrals are completely identical, except that they have a different sign, so they cancel. And so we should have a look at this one, because here we have a term with a plus sign here and a minus sign there. And therefore the result is the following. Here is the resulting expression, which has a factor of 2, because I have the same contribution uh, for the first term as I have for the second term, however with a different sign, because the x0 has turned into a minus x0 there. And uh, together with this minus sign, I have a factor of 2. Then I can extract this term, rho prime 0t, in front of the integrals, and I have here an x0, which is negative. The integrant uh, apart from that is, pos is uh, positive. And so therefore, I have a negative result. I have, uh, in fact, minus rho prime to zero t times the diffusion constant times delta t. Performing the integral is a little bit tricky, but it, uh, it is, in fact, uh, straightforward. So this is the result. And this is Fick's law of diffusion, or this expresses Fick's law of diffusion. What we have calculated is the amount of particles which during a period delta t flow through x is zero. And it's in fact it was the net flow of particles because we took the particles moving to the right with a plus sign and those moving to the left with a minus sign. So by definition this is also j times delta t, and j is then calculated at x0, so it's the flux that we have calculated at x0. But of course there is nothing special about the point that we have taken. We have now taken the point x0. We could have taken any point, and therefore we have in general that the flux j as a function of x and t, is d times, with a minus sign, the derivative of a rho with respect to x at x and t. This is the one-dimensional version. It can be generalized to more dimensions, and then it reads jr of t is minus d times the gradient of rho. R of t. And this is the famous Fick's law of diffusion. And what it tells us is the following. If you have a variation in the concentration of particles, the flux is always such that it tries to even out the uh, distribution of the particles. So it always tries to flatten the particle density. Fick's first law which gives us the diffusive current, is not yet the diffusion equation. In order to derive the diffusion equation, we need to combine this with a different law, which uh, tells us something about the conservation of particles. So we consider a volume of V, which is bounded by a surface A, and uh, we consider this change in the amount of particles inside V. So how does that change in the course of time? Well, the total amount of particles is the integral of the particle density over the volume. And if we compare that uh, for t and t plus delta t, we have this expression. So this expresses the change in the amount of particles inside V. If we realize how the number of particles can change, we, c we conclude that this can only change by particles passing through the surface area A, and the flux of those particles is J, so we have to integrate that over the surface area, and that is per unit time. So if we have a delta T here, we need to multiply this by delta T. What is important in writing up the right-hand side is that we neglect the effects where a particle or the processes in which a particle could just disappear into a sink or it could just appear from a source. So there are no sources or sinks.
So only particles moving through the surface can change the total number of particles inside the volume. We then note that the left hand side can be written as the derivative of rho with respect to t times delta t. That delta t cancels against this delta t, so we have then that the derivative of rho with respect to dt is equal to minus j dot dA. And for that last expression we use the divergence theorem in order to convert the surface integral into a volume integral at the price of putting a, a, a divergence in front of the j. And if this should hold for any possible volume, so this should hold for any volume that we can think of, then we obviously have that d rho dt is minus a divergence of j. So we have d rho dt is minus divergence of j, and that expresses in fact the conservation of matter, and it's called the continuity equation. Combining the continuity equation with Fick's first law, so we use that j diffusion is minus d times gradient of rho, we plug that in, we immediately obtain the diffusion equation, and uh, we have uh, arrived at a similar equation before, but that was in terms of p, the probability to find uh, a particle at a certain position, and obviously uh, they, these two are strongly related. Rho is proportional to p, and uh, so you see that if you plug in p, the probability to find a particle somewhere, uh, then that also satisfies the diffusion equation which we have now derived in two ways. Uh, the way that we have just seen was uh, using Fick's law that we derived first at, uh, in quite some detail. We combined it with the continuity equation and before uh, we had used a different approach and that was for the probability. And that was from a time evolution of the probability, but in both cases the uh, essential the uh, assumption that was the fact that the t that the x satisfies a Gaussian distribution probability if we release a particle from a particular position for some time. So far we have considered diffusion in the absence of a systematic force. So the Langevin equation contained just the drag and the random force. Now we introduce the systematic form force once again and uh, for a physical picture you could think of gravity, particles are dragged towards the bottom of the system, or you could think of a, an electric field which uh, pushes particles that have a charge in one direction. And in order to make progress we will now assume for simplicity t that this force F is constant in time and does not depend on the position. If we assume F to be constant, we can consider the situation in which the velocity is stationary, in that case the time derivative of the average velocity should be zero, and from the right hand side we see then that minus gamma V plus F should be zero. If the force is absent, the average velocity is zero, but if the force is there and it's constant, then we will find a constant velocity and therefore a constant flux, which is induced by this drift force. So that's the drift flux, Jf. And what happens if the system is closed is that if the particles move towards one uh, direction, they will heap up at one side of the system. So for example if I have a, a container and I drive all the particles to the right then they will heap up towards the right wall and so because there is now a strong slope in the density of the particles there will be a flux which counteracts the drift force. So and that's the diffusion flux. So if the, in the end we will reach a situation in which the drift flux is balanced by the diffusive flux and then obviously the particles don't move anymore and if we have that balance we have the following equation the gradient of rho divided by rho is f over gamma d
And so we generalize this result now to forces that really depend on the position, because then you can uh, maintain the same argument in the end if the force does not depend on time, but it depends on position. This flux will depend on position, but in the end you will have a diffusion flux, diffusive flux, which is also depending on position. And we will have this balance equation, which leads to this final result. Now it's uh, useful to write this force as the gradient of a potential. So here we see gradient potential divided by gamma d. And we can rewrite the left-hand side as the gradient of the logarithm of rho. And that enables us to write up the solution right away. The solution is then given directly as a constant times e to the power minus u over gamma d. And that is the distribution that we find in equilibrium. But on the other hand, we know that uh, in equilibrium this should be the Boltzmann distribution. So it should be a constant times e to the power minus u over kt. And therefore we see that gamma times d is kbt. That is the same result as we obtained already before. So the diffusion constant together with the drag can be related to kt. In the absence of a drift force, we had a diffusion equation which described the probability to find a particle in a certain position. And it's interesting to ask ourselves how we can generalize that diffusion equation to the case in which there are also drift forces present. We perform the calculation along the same lines as before. So we take a uh, distribution p at time t, the particle is then at position x primed, which is uh, delta x away from the final position x. And t is the probability to move over a distance delta x, but it depends now on the starting position, and uh, the delta t is the time that elapses. We calculate the moment delta x uh, for this distribution, this transition distribution t, and later we shall also address the delta x squared. Now the delta x is uh, caused by diffusion and by drift. The diffusion contribution averages out because the uh, diffusion doesn't have preferred direction. So the linear term in x doesn't have any contribution. And the uh, force gives an average velocity of f over gamma, as we have just seen. And we multiply that by delta t in order to find the displacement. So that's the first moment of the transition probability. It's the average displacement of the particle during a time delta t. We also calculate the second moment to the lowest order in delta t. And the diffusive part gives us 2d times delta t. There is obviously also a ballistic part, but that ballistic part scales with delta t squared, so that's omitted here. So the second moment of this distribution to first order in delta t can be written as 2, 2 times d times delta t. Now we return to this evolution equation and we multiply the left and the right hand side by a delta function x minus x zero and then we integrate over x. So not over the delta x, the, it's the integration which is here, but over the x, that's this x. We then obtain the following result. So in the left hand side, if I multiply by this delta function and then integrate, I just replace the argument x here by an x zero. On the right hand side, I do that not immediately. I just write the p here and the t just like they were here, except that I have replaced the x primed here, that's the previous x, by x minus delta x. That's the same, but I would like to have only x and delta x as variables and not the third variable x primed into the problem. And then I have here my delta function and I integrate over x. It is then natural to tailor expand that equation and uh, if we take the zeroth order term on the right hand side together with the delta function it gives me a minus p x zero comma t on the left hand side so just as before we can write that as delta t times dp dt and here i have restricted myself to the first order terms the second order term i will analyze that later it would be too complicated to take it into account right away so i put a 
one here in order to emphasize that on the right hand side we only take the first order uh, Taylor expansion in delta x. So we have a p here at x minus delta x, so that gives me a first order Taylor term minus delta x times dp dx, and the same for t. The second term here gives me a minus delta x coming from this argument dt dx. And so the dp dx is okay, the dt dx is a little bit inconvenient, but we can do something about that. In fact, we had seen before that the, that the first moment can be written as the force divided by gamma of this. And if I take the derivative with respect to x on the left and on the right hand side, then we obtain the following equation. Uh, I have d dx of the first moment, so that's this. Then I have df dx divided by gamma multiplied by delta t. And then on the right hand side, I have d dx of t because this x primed can be written as x minus x del minus delta x. So I take here the first derivative and now lo and behold, this term here is exactly the same as the one I have in this integral and the rest does not depend on delta x. So I can just replace the integral over delta x by df dx over gamma times delta t. And that yields the following result. I have two integrals, one with a derivative of p multiplied by f and one with uh, p multiplied by the derivative of f. Well, putting in the delta functions then gives me immediately the result. And that result is minus one over gamma times the derivative with respect to the x zero of the product of p and f. So that is the result of the first order Taylor expanded terms in x. However, the second order terms also give a contribution, so I should consider those as well. These terms are analyzed exactly in the same way as above, and so we have the, again the same result. It's just the diffusive term from the diffusion equation, which is uh, just unchanged in this case. So I should add this term here, and then I end up with the final equation. The Shmolokovsky equation, which is uh, more or less like the diffusion equation, the term on the left hand side together with the second term on the right hand side, they give me the diffusion equation and we see that the drift force F has introduced an extra term minus d dx, p times F over gamma. And obviously uh, this equation, well, we have assumed that the f is constant. Uh, it's if f is constant enough over a certain area where the other quantities have a rapid variation, then this equation is still invariably valid. So the Shmolikovsky equation can be used for any kind of transport process uh, where we have drift in addition to diffusion. As usual, the uh, probability to find a particle somewhere is proportional to the density, so we can also read rho instead of the p, and then the Shmolikovsky equation in more dimensions can be rewritten in this form, and if the time is again taking uh, very large, then we should have that the uh, distribution does no longer change in time, so that's the equilibrium situation, and then we have equals zero on the right hand side. So now we have an equation that we can solve. And again, we find that rho is equal to e to the power minus ur is uh, over gamma d. Hence we have that kbt over gamma is uh, d and that's the Einstein relation. And this is in fact very uh, close to the derivation that we have given above, but although there we just use the properties of V. So here we have the same equation, the Boltzmann factor, and from that we inferred again this Einstein relation. And it's a relation between the drag and the diffusion coefficient on one hand and the temperature on the other hand. It is interesting to apply the Shmolikovsky equation to the transport of electrons that are moving in an electric field, for example, inside a conductor. Then the electronic current is given by rho, which is now not the number density, 
but it's the charge density, so it's E times N, where N is the number density. So it's minus rho times F over gamma. F over gamma was the velocity, as we have seen before. And if you multiply the charge density by the velocity, we get the electric current. That's equal to uh, minus E times the diffusion current. So normally the diffusion current is a number current. And because I want to relate it to the electric current, I have this extra factor of E. But the rho then occurring here is the electric charge density. So I have a minus D times the rho dx. And I know for a fact that the rho has the form uh, of constant times e to the power minus e v of x over kbt. We have seen that several times before. Taking the derivative is straightforward and I get the gradient of v, the gradient of e v, and the gradient of v is equal to the force, the electric force, and that's e times the field. And so we have E times D times the electric field over KBT times E to the power minus EVX over KT. And now I use the fact that I can re replace this C times the exponent by rho. That was rho. So I simply write it now in this form. J is proportional to rho. That's uh, e identical to this equation. But now we have uh, a more specific prefactor here. In electricity, we usually relate the electric current to the field using a quantity sigma, which is the conductivity. So in particular, the electric current density is proportional to the field with a proportionality constant of sigma. Using that definition, we can rewrite this result as follows. We have E times D times rho over KBT for the conductivity. And because rho is E times the number density, this is E squared dN over KBT. And this is, uh, well, first of all, you can call it, uh, you can say it's Ohm's law, but more in particular, this is the Drude conductivity. And you see that this comes quite naturally out of the Shmolikovsky equation. Now that we have come to an end of the analysis, it's time to summarize the findings of the Langevin equation and the consequences for diffusion. We have written up the Langevin equation as a function for the velocity. Here it's one dimensional. So on the left hand side, you see the force. On the right hand side, you see the effect due to the other particles, which is first of all a drag. And second, there is a random force. It describes the random kicks that the other particles give to the particle we are studying. And for the random force, we make the following statistical assumptions. Whenever there is a uh, expectation value that is an average over all the possible realizations of the random force, which is subject to the following statistical conditions, it averages out to zero. The second one is that there are no time correlations, so there is a delta function here. And the third one is uh, says that the force is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. Now the most strong assumption is the second one, which neglects the time correlations. In reality there are hydrodynamic modes in the fluid and they will cause time correlations. We neglect those and that's justified if the particle we are considering, the degree of freedom we are considering, moves a lot slower than the other one so it will receive many kicks and the averages of the, of the kicks can be described by such a random force. For these conditions on the random force, we can derive the following. We can derive several properties of the solution or to the Langevin equation. The first one is that the velocity will damp out on average exponentially. That's due to the drag of the other particles. But if we look at the velocity squared, there is of course also a damped term here. But in the end, the particle will keep oscillating due to the random kicks. So this is an effect which is due to the, the random forces. And th there is a, an unknown number q here, yet unknown, but it is defined in terms of the temperature.
because the average velocity squared should be related to the temperature. So this Q is 2 gamma times kBT, gamma is the drag, and T is the temperature of the fluid or the gas. It is also interesting to consider the distribution, the statistical distribution of the velocities. So we have a statistical distribution of the random force that was in the three assumptions for the random, a random force. And from that, we can derive an equation which governs the evolution of the distribution of the velocities. And that's this equation. It's known as the Fokker-Planck equation. If we solve the stationary uh, case, so the dp dt is zero, then from this follows the Maxwell distribution. And so that's a kind of consistency check, at least that the Maxwell distribution comes out correctly. Of course, it's also interesting to look at the position x, and we can find that the x squared expectation value goes to 2 times d times t. d is a constant, it's uh, the diffusion constant, and it's again related to known parameters. It's kBt over gamma. So this is the most important property of diffusion, that the distance traveled squared is linear in time. And if we consider the distribution of the positions of the particles as a function of time, we can derive an equation for that, and that's the famous diffusion equation. dp dt is d dx, and then there is a diffusion constant which may depend on x itself, and then there is d dx p. So the d depends on x in an inhomogeneous medium, in a homogeneous medium we can put it in front of this, and then we have d times the second derivative with respect to x. The diffusion equation. We can also derive a equation, an equation for the flux, which is the number of particles passing per second through a unit area. And that flux is denoted generally as J. And it's this, the D, it's the same diffusion constant times the gradient of the density. And the density is proportional to the probability that we have considered before. And uh, the continuity equation tells us that there are no particles uh, disappearing into sinks or arising from sources. And in that case, the conservation of the number of particles is expressed by the so-called continuity equation. d rho dt plus divergence of j is zero. And if I combine the continuity equation with Fick's law, then we can uh, quite easily derive the diffusion equation again, so we recover the equation that is written here. If we consider transport, there is not only diffusion, there is also a driving force, uh, and we call it usually a drift force. Think of an electric field which uh, pushes the electrons into one, equa into one direction. In that case, the diffusion equation is extended. So in this uh, term on the right-hand side, the second term is the diffusion term. And then there is an extra term, which contains the drift force F. And this equation is the Smolikovsky equation. And the Smolikovsky equation then concludes this summary of the Langevin equation and diffusion.